What's going on, guys? Welcome into episode number 60 of the Ask Tony Show. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Today, we have some great questions going back to the Q&A. Uh, we had a great interview, uh, but now we're going to get back into the, the uh, Q&A, and let's jump right into it. Is it possible to start owning property without a large sum of money? This is actually a misconception that surprisingly a lot of people have. And the misconception is that you need a ton of money, that you need 20% down, 15% down to be able to purchase a home. The truth is you don't. Now, that being said, it's not absolute zero, right? So you still need to have some money, but you don't need $50,000 or $100,000. So depending on the program that you're going to use and you want to reach out to your loan officer for all those specifics of which programs you qualify for and things like that. But there are two main programs that can be used. The first one is called FHA. So with FHA, a normal down payment is 3.5%, 3.5% of the home price. Okay. Then there's conventional. So conventional has more options. Sometimes you can do 3%. Sometimes you can do 5%. Again, your loan officer would be able to tell you exactly which program you could qualify for. But usually that's about what it is, right? So if we take out our calculator, if let's say you're buying a home that is $400,000, if you're using FHA, it's 3.5%. So it's a down payment of about $14,000, okay? So again, you do need some, you don't need you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, but it does help to have a down payment. Now, whenever I talk about this, always comes a question of these down payment assistance programs, which I've talked about in the past. Down payment assistance programs do exist. They're, you know, grant programs or programs like Utah Housing, a lot of different ones out there. And so the only thing that you have to remember, as I've mentioned before, when you use these programs is that they're not free either, right? So they are lending you your down payment funds. Specifically, if we talk about Utah housing, which is one of the most popular ones here in, in, in the state, they give you a second loan. So it's not free, guys. It's never free. So that's what you have to keep in mind. If you can bring a down payment, then your interest rate is going to be lower. You can qualify for a higher quality home. Uh, your payment, hence, is also going to be lower. So it is in your best interest to bring a down payment if you can. If you cannot, then you can use these programs. You just have to understand the math. So if you understand the math and you're okay with the math and you know that your interest rate, if you use Utah housing is going to be two points higher, there is some origination fees and things like that. If you're cool, then that's cool. And you can use it and you don't have to bring nearly as much money, even though I would still say that you're going to need some, maybe 1%, 1.5% of the purchase price, even if you're using a down payment assistance program. Because not only is it your down payment funds, but you also have your closing costs. So closing costs differ from lender to lender. What are closing costs? Basically, it's what the lender charges for originating the mortgage. So sometimes that can be $6,000, $10,000, $4,000, depending on the lender. Again, ask your loan officer what their specific closing costs are and keep those in consideration. So all of those different factors, guys, play in here. But the direct uh, answer to the question is you do need some money, but you don't need a truckload of cash. How do you make property work for you? How do you make property work for you? Well, the way to make property work for you is typically there's two ways. Okay. When you talk about homes, if you talk about commercial, it gets a little bit more intense. But if you talk about just residential real estate, there are two ways. Number one is if it's your primary residence, right? You make your payments. Maybe you can make a little bit extra payments to principal, but over time, your debt starts to go down and hopefully your home value starts to go up. So what a lot of people will do is they will allow that process to play out for a year, year and a half, two years. And all of a sudden they have this thing that's called equity, right? Equity is the difference between what you owe on the home and what the home is actually worth in the market. So for example, if you owe $200,000 and your home is worth $400,000, then that gap, those extra $200,000, that's called equity. So what a lot of people will do is they'll buy one home, maybe a starter home. It's not their dream home, but just a home that they're comfortable with, that they can live in. 
and they allow that process to take time to basically play itself out. It takes time, but eventually they'll get to a point where they have substantial equity. So when that happens, they can take money out. So they can either do a cash out refinance. They can get a, uh, what's called a HELOC, a home equity line of credit. They can take some of that money and use it to purchase another property. So in that way, basically your initial investment of your primary residence can in a way pay for your next property for the down payment on property number two. So when you do it that way, you just basically replicate the process. House A, you buy it, it appreciates, take money out, you buy home B. Same thing, you put renters in there, you let it appreciate, you let the debt go down, take that equity and you purchase property C. And so that is the most common way. The other way that uh, you can do it is through rentals, right? So if you want to create a passive income, then you can purchase rentals. In that case, you do usually, typically you're going to need higher down payments, about 20% down to purchase investment properties. So that's the second way to make property work for you is you buy it, you rent it out, you charge more in rent than what your monthly payment is, and that difference is called cash flow. So all of a sudden you can buy a condo, rent it out, and you let's say you rent it for $500 more than your monthly payment. Well, those $500, that's passive income. So as long as you have a tenant in there paying for paying for that for that property, you're going to make $500 a month and you replicate it, right? Property A, property B, property C, property D. All of a sudden you're making $2,000, $3,000 a month of passive income and those checks keep coming in. So when you talk about making property work for you, that's typically uh, the simplest ways and the most common ways that uh, people use to make sure that those properties give them a long-term or a short-term benefit depending on their goals. What are some things that people overlook when owning property? I think that the one thing that a lot of people overlook is the tax, right? The, how, how does purchasing a home work when it comes to my taxes? And so I am not an accountant, but the recommendation here, guys, is to align yourself and hire an accountant that really understands real estate. Because there's so many deductions from your upfront mortgage insurance, if you're doing FHA, to the interest that you're paying month after month after month. So all of those costs that you have can have benefits when it comes to doing your taxes. The problem is that I've heard of a lot of stories of accountants telling people that it doesn't really matter. There's really no point in using your home or, or you know, declaring certain things from your home onto your taxes. And I, I feel that that is a tremendous mistake. So aside from, you know, the inspection of the home and how much am I going to pay and the school district, all, all the, I guess, immediate things that people think about when they go out to buy a home, the other layer to this would be to really try to educate yourself on the tax benefits. And again, find an accountant that you feel comfortable with that understands all of these types of things that can then explain it to you so that you can get all of the benefits. And that's just talking about your primary residence. If you go into, um, you know, what we we're talking about previously, if you have rentals, if you have investment properties, if you do flips, whatever it is, every action you take with real estate has a tax implication. So you have to understand, you know, I've talked about capital gains tax on this show in in the past. If you sell a property, what are the requirements? Do I have to pay capital gains tax? Do I not have to pay? All those different things. And so it's very important for you to educate yourself on the tax implications of your real estate decisions. What kind of mentality do you have to have to be in real estate? The mentality, this is kind of tough because depending on your personality, there are different ways to do it. So if you look at it from a consumer perspective, in my opinion, the mentality is start small, right? Start small. You're probably not going to afford your dream home on the first go right? So you might have to use a down payment assistance program. You may ha- have to use a first time home buyer program. You might not qualify for a ton. So because you don't qualify for a lot, you may have to go to an area that maybe isn't your favorite. Maybe the home isn't a hundred percent what you love, but you got to get your foot in the door. 
And so I've seen so many people that start buying something that they didn't love, honestly, but it was in a good area. It was good enough. It had basically what they needed. It, it had the basics for them and they bought it. They let that process play out like we we're talking about in question number one. And they eventually transitioned to other properties and to bigger and better things. But if you're in a situation where you want to buy your dream home right out of the gate, sometimes, and in most cases, you're just not going to be able to do so. So it's better to buy something. Now, you're not going to buy a dump, right? It has to be good enough for you. But the point that I'm trying to make is don't stay out of the real estate game just because you can't afford your dream home. Let the process play out, educate yourself, and learn to play the game. And eventually, those that home or those homes that you start kind of going up the stairs, eventually they'll help you get to your dream home. But if you try to start at the dream home, you're probably not gonna get there. What are some major things to expect from real estate? If we talk about the next couple of years, if you will, obviously nobody knows, but I think that real estate is going to continue to go in an upward progression, right? We've seen ups and downs. We've seen crashes and we've seen recoveries and crashes and recoveries. So the good thing about real estate is that it always bounces back. It may crash for a little bit, but it will come back. So it is, in my opinion, probably one of, if not the safest investment that you can make because no matter what happens, guys, people still need a place to live. They still need a place to live. And so whether you can rent out your home, whether if you have equity, you can then later sell it. If you get yourself in trouble, you can sell it, take the money, pay down debt. So it just really creates so many different opportunities. Again, for your family to live in, if that changes, you can rent it out, you can sell, you can refinance. There's so many different things that you can do. But what do I see? is I see what we've been saying for the last 100 years, which is stability in real estate. It is probably the best investment that you can make. But again, sometimes you got to start small and sometimes you have to start somewhere where it's not your favorite, but learn to play the game and eventually things are going to be okay.